We thank you, Lord God, that this is the day the Lord has made, and we do rejoice, and we are glad in it, Father God. We thank you, Jesus, that lives are changed when they meet you. We thank you, Jesus, that there's lives being changed right now because you're present. We thank you, Lord God, that the music will bring us to our state of closeness in your presence. May we be in your presence as we worship, Lord God. May we leave behind our own agenda, our own thoughts, our own ways, our own actions. And may we instead look to you and take our eyes to the heavens and be grateful for this day, this time, this moment. May we stay in this moment while we're here and keep our eyes fixed on you the entire time. In the name of Jesus, we love you, Father. Amen. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. How we love Jesus. Tell the person next to you, I love Jesus. How about you? Can you say it? I love Jesus. How about you? I love Jesus. How about you? How about you? Do you love Jesus? I don't know about you, but I love Jesus. I love Jesus. You know, we've been talking about Matthew 22, 27, and that's August's topic. And it says this, 22, 37, and he replied to him. Are you with me? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Say that. With all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great most important principle and first commandment and a second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself so we've been talking about loving our neighbor and we had a gentleman from another country pastor from another country come and speak and he was serving a population of people much in need and we enjoyed getting to know him and hearing his story it was much like ours right here in every city there's a place to serve and have mercy and compassion isn't there in every single city we have been after that listening to frederick bletson who was here last week and shared with us about the story of a man's life and the story of that man's life was victory because of god's mercy and grace amen does anybody else have victory in the house because of god's mercy and grace I can't imagine anybody be here tonight if that wasn't the case, right? Tonight, we are going to take a practical look at the action steps of this commandment. This is made clear in the scripture of Matthew 25, 35 through 40. And this is kind of a tough one to take inside ourselves and realize that what we're here to do on earth as Christians is please God. We're not here to please each other. We're here to please God. And this is what he requires of us. And this is really a deep subject, but God provides a way for us to be this way. He has given us the open door to be able to be like him and have mercy and compassion. So let's read that. I'll read it for you. You could read it if you like. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you brought me together with yourselves and welcomed and lodged me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. You helped me in my care. I was in prison, and you came to see me. Any of you been there? Have any of you experienced that love of Jesus yourself? Amen. Then the just and upright will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you and entertained you or naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come and visit you? And the king will reply to them and us, to them and us. Truly I tell you, insofar as you did it for one of the least in estimation of men and brethren, then you did it for me. So our good Lord 
has told us what to do. And what we do with that is to honor him. But to have mercy and compassion on others comes literally from him through us to them. I was driving down the road. I brought some lunch with me to go into our office. And there was a gentleman going through a garbage can. I was perplexed. I wanted that food I packed. I really wanted to have that for lunch. And I heard inside of me the spirit of God saying, he's hungry, feed him. Hey, hey, you across the street, he's digging through a garbage can, right? Hey, I got lunch for you. He didn't respond. He's digging, he's looking for food. Hey, come on, watch for cars. Here's your lunch. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. It is more important to be obedient to his word than to eat your lunch. And that's what this scripture is talking about to bring it down to our life into these moments. Compassion or kindly forbearance shown toward another person in one's power. So that gentleman was in my power, wasn't he? I had the power to feed him or not to feed him. Amen. That is having mercy and giving to the poor. We have a choice. We have a choice every single day. We can decide whether we want to honor Jesus or we want to honor ourselves. Think about yourselves and your days and the work that some of us do. And we have a decision to make on a daily basis. What shall I do in these circumstances? Should I go ahead and honor Jesus or should I think about myself? What's your answer? What's your answer? The meaning of compassion is to recognize suffering. The meaning of compassion is to recognize suffering. But that isn't the totality. We can recognize suffering just by walking out this door, can't we? But it's the action steps that brings us to mercy. It's the action steps when we see someone hurting to want to help them. We want to come to them. We want to pray. We want to offer them love, compassion, and everything that God has offered to us. And if you further read the rest of this scripture, which is not our focus tonight, but I feel as though I should read this, and the king will reply to them, truly I tell you. Then he will say to those at his left hand, be gone from me. You cursed into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. Wow. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me or entertain me or take me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me with help and ministering care. Then they also in their turn will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? When? And he will reply to them, Solemnly I declare to you, in as far as you failed to do it for the least, then you failed to do it for me. If we don't do what God asks us to do, we do fail. We do fail to please God, and I believe this is a group of God-pleasers. I believe that his word is the truth, and that if he tells you to do these things, he's going to teach you how, and he's going to make a way for you to do it. Now, that doesn't mean you need to sit and feel guilty because you didn't do something. That is God saying, hey, let's move forward now, and let's go ahead and do those things that I'm asking you to do. So, As Christians, that Holy Spirit that flows through us teaches us how to be his children. I am a child of God. Can you say it? I am a child of God. So if I am a child of God, that means God lives inside of me, and I have the ability to do what God did. I have the ability. I have a decision to make, but I do have the ability to. So let's break down and read again but I'm just going to go to the breakdown part, and that's one through six, because this is the lesson for tonight. Jesus does these things, and he wants us to do the same, and he is teaching us tonight 
to honor him in all these ways. Number one, I was hungry and you gave me food. This is what he's asking us to do to love our neighbor. If we're going to love our neighbor, he is giving us how to love our neighbor. It's not just high five, can I pray for you, as they walk down the road and they're hungry. It's not to say, sorry, I don't have any clothes for you if you've got two jackets, one in the car and one on your back. Jesus, if we truly want to honor Jesus and be his children, the children of God he's called us to, we will take this seriously because he takes us seriously. I tell you, when I cry out to him, I'm really grateful he listens, right? But the other side of that is, I am his child, and I need to honor him by listening to what his word is teaching us. Amen? Can you see the importance of both sides of the scale? If we want Jesus to be there for us, we need to be good kids. We need to hear his word and honor it and respond to it quickly because so often, I, I honestly felt when that guy did that, and I had just read this, that it was Jesus over there going through the garbage. I honestly felt that. I thought, oh, man, am I being tested with my happy little lunch in the car, right? But I tell you, what's more important to me, my belly or loving God and honoring God and doing as he teaches us to as his children? I am a kid that calls out to him every day, and if I want him to answer, I better be a good little girl, right? Because when you do what he says, you run boldly to the throne of God, Scripture says. If you don't do what he says, you feel kind of skittish. Well, God, you know, if it's in your will, can I be healed? Right? Do you hear those kind of prayers? I do too. They make me sick. They really do. They really do. Because the fact is, he has said you are healed. And if I can go boldly to his throne and say, Jesus, help me. I need healing. Jesus, help me. I need more money to get through the month. Jesus, help me. My car is broken. Jesus, help me. You fill in the blanks. I need a job. Jesus, help me. I'm lonely. Jesus, help me. I'm depressed. Jesus, help me come out of this state of lack. Give me the provisions to live life to the full till it overflows with goodness. Jesus, help me. If I do that, what can I do for him? I can do what he requests, and then I can run to him like a little child. Now, I'm not saying you can't pray to him any old time, whether you listen or you don't. But your confidence in his answering prayer is hinged on your own actions. Did you get that? Your confidence is hinged on your own actions. So if we want to be confident, we need to be doing the things that Jesus teaches us to do and following through with them. Amen? Number two thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Now, when I think of hunger and thirst, I think of hunger and thirsting after Jesus. That's what I think of first. But this is talking about strictly, or maybe both, thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. Have you ever been thirsty? Have you ever been so parched that you were just, oh, I need something to drink? Have you ever been so parched that you just needed Jesus so bad, you just couldn't take it a minute longer. You're hunger and thirsting after Jesus. He is telling us that we as Christians can answer that for others. We can bring that to somebody else who is hungry for something and they don't know what it is, or they're thirsting for something and it may not be water. <laughs> But we can intercede and we can help them as Christians. And he lines us up with those people, doesn't he? He just lines us up with them. And what we do with that opportunity he gave us is entirely up to us. This is lesson number two. What do we do with the opportunity that he puts in front of us? Do we give that somebody something to drink when they're thirsty? If they're thirsting after the Lord. They're thirsting after something. They're broken. They're lost. They feel forgotten. Do we bring them cool water and the Holy Spirit and introduce them to our Savior? You know, that's our opportunity right there in front of us. Number three, a stranger. I was a stranger and you welcomed me and brought me in. How difficult it is for us comfortable Christians to bring a stranger even into our own church. Isn't that the truth? Come to church with me, or come over here and let me pray with you, because a lot of people aren't comfortable at church if they don't know Jesus. More people get saved outside of the church than in the church. Truth? 
So there's a lot of different organizations and places you can go to bring people to Jesus, right in your own circle of influence, right? Evangelism, the strangers that are wandering out there, lost, forgotten, needing help, needing a hand, needing a place to land. Number four, I was naked and you clothed me. Do you remember in the beginning of the Bible when Adam and Eve were with Jesus and they were doing what they're supposed to as God's kids and then when they sinned, right? And they were naked and comfortable with it. But when they sinned, they were no longer comfortable with being naked. I believe this has something to do with that. I was naked and you clothed me. We want to clothe people with the love of Jesus Christ. We also want to clothe them and give them a jacket if they need one on a cold day, right? We want to meet the needs of people because God says, love your neighbor as you do yourself. So I tell you what, if I love myself and I'm cold, I certainly would want to put a jacket on a friend, someone maybe I hadn't even met before, but I would put a jacket on a friend that was cold too, and naked because they feel guilty and shameful. That's the other side, the spiritual side. So we want to clothe them with the love of Jesus. Amen? So this is his commands to us, how to love your neighbor. It's very clear how we're supposed to love our neighbor. We say this all the time, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and spirit, and love your neighbor as yourself, and then we never go any deeper. We never look at what does that really mean? What is he asking me to do? What should I be doing differently or adding to loving my neighbor? Does it mean I go knock on their door and give them a hug? It means all of that. Everyone we meet is our neighbor. Even if we meet them and we don't know them yet, they're still our neighbor. I was sick and you visited me. Has anybody ever been sick and felt so excited when someone comes to you and brings you soup? I mean, what a healing thing that is. Bring me some soup when I'm sick, right? I was sick and you visited me. When you visit the sick, you're being a good neighbor. When you bring them the soup, you're being even better. But when you just visit them and, and you pray for them and you show them they're not alone with this sickness, you show them that you're there for them and with them. And I bet everyone in this room knows what it feels like to be sick. We have all been so sick. We were crying and crawling on the floor. At least I have. Have you? And how important it is to have someone come to you at those moments and say to you, I'm here for you. What can I do? Shall we pray? I believe God's going to heal you right now. That's what God's asking us to do, to love our neighbors. Loving your neighbor is a verb. It's a verb. It's an action. Number six, I'm in prison and you came. You came. You came to see me. Now, prison is prison, but prison is prison, right? The prison in the head, right? We've all been in the head prison where you can't get out of your own thinking, right? When someone comes to us and they help us process and get out of that place in their head, that's being a good neighbor. If someone's in prison and it's a physical prison, they need to be visited no matter what without judgment because they're us and we're them because we're neighbors and we're all the same, just doing different things at different times in life, right? So we need to be good neighbors to those either in the prison of addiction, the prison of, the prison of depression, the prison of fear, so they're not moving forward with their life, or if the physical prison. I served as a prayer minister and a, a teacher at the jail. That was a powerful experience. The part I loved was ministering to the women. The part I hated was when you walked in and the door slammed. <laughs> That was a very challenging moment for me when that door slammed. I got claustrophobic and walked. I was okay, breathe, breathe. I need someone to minister to me, and I think the Lord did because I kept going back week after week. But I tell you, when you, I went in there and I'd just sit down at a table and read my Bible and say nothing because I understand people. And pretty soon one would come and they would say, what are you doing here? I'm just sitting here. What are you doing here? And I'd just let them gather one at a time. What are you reading? You want to hear? Okay. And it grew to one or two people, to a floor of people, to a whole 
area of people wanting to be loved because they found someone that was their neighbor, not someone that was coming in to tell them to do something, but someone that just showed up just like them. That's loving our neighbor. So it's clear that God wants us to love our neighbor, and he has told us that directly and deliberately, to love our neighbor. And if we don't love our neighbor, we still have a chance to love our neighbor and change. And if we love our neighbor in some ways and not in other ways, we still have the opportunity to kind of gird ourselves up and become people that could put loving our neighbor more important than our own comfort or our own judgment. How do you not judge someone going through the garbage can, right? Because of God's mercy and grace, mercy and compassion. His mercy and compassion, as in Micah 6, 8, says this. Micah 6, 8 is a powerful scripture. It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require? The word require is a serious word. Require of you. But to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. How do we love our neighbor? We love our neighbor the way Christ has shown us to through his actions with us, with everyone on earth. He loves us all the same. He's not a respecter of persons. And honestly, I believe it's true. He does not judge us. I believe I can show up a mess and Jesus is going to be right there. How do you feel about that? I can show up a mess. I don't have to show up all perfect and Christianese. I can show up however I am at that moment. I could be coming down from something. I can be coming up from something. I could be doing whatever I'm doing. But the fact is, Jesus loves us all the same. He loves that person as much as he loves the person that sat in church since they were that high and did everything they were supposed to but never really knew Jesus. Right? So he loves us all the same. There is not one person he would love more than the other. So how do we love Jesus and love our neighbors as ourselves? How do we do it? Number one through six. Study it, you guys. Study it and take it into your heart and really think about how can I love my neighbor? We all come across neighbors every day. We go into a grocery store, there's a neighbor right? We're going down the road and we see someone hungry and there's a neighbor. We're at work, we're at Boeing's, wherever you work, you're at places where you can literally love your neighbor as Christ has loved us and teaches us to love others. Do you want to stand and pray and then we'll worship a little more? So if anybody here tonight has guilt about not loving their neighbor the way they think they should. Does anybody here have guilt about that? If, don't raise your hand. But if you do, but if you do, here's your chance to lay down the guilt, okay? And start doing what God is asking you to do right now. If you're a person that thinks you shouldn't walk up to somebody and help them, here's your chance right now to go ahead and give yourself permission to be a good neighbor to all people. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you right now that you are with us and you have taught us your ways of doing things. I thank you, Lord, that we do love you with all of our heart, mind, body, spirit, and we do love our neighbors as ourselves. And Lord, continue teaching us to follow after you and be a God pleaser, not a people pleaser, not a person that cares about what other people think about what we're doing or not doing, that we don't even look around to care, but we look to you to share. Father God, we love you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.